cool we are recording how's it guys it's mj and in these videos i'm going to be talking about um, various things about finance for the fellowship exam so the previous one was around households and how they influence the economic environment um, this time we're going to be talking about financial intermediaries i always wonder if i'm spelling this stuff correctly uh, financial intermediaries. Okay, remember these videos are unscripted, um, unedited. It's me just giving my opinion, studying out loud. So don't take any of it as factual and feel free to challenge all of it in the comment section below. Um, like I said, it is going to be a lot of opinion based and I am going to be quite skeptical when I approach the material. This is just helps me to to think and to um, you know get the creative thinking uh, juices flowing. Okay, financial intermediaries. What do I mean by financial intermediaries? I'm talking about uh, banks, insurance companies. Um, what else, else are financial intermediaries? Uh, pension funds, um, investment banks. I mean, uh, collective investment vehicles. Um, what else we've got asset managers basically any middleman in the money um, the money thing uh, asset management so in the sense that you have businesses that use capital for productivity and you have investors who give up capital to fund that productivity intermediaries are the guys in between and my opinion at the moment is that they're actually, we're not going to have these things in the future. These things are actually terrible. Um, with artificial intelligence and blockchain technology, we can have a future without, of these, without these guys. And I think that's a good thing because these guys make lots and lots of money. Um, yes, they've added a lot of value to society in the past, but I think in the future, we're not going to see them playing a very big role. But I'm talking about the far distant future, you know, something like 2018, you know, far away. No, I'm joking. Maybe like uh, 100 years from now. But so before that happens, we do need to, to consider them. We do need to think about them and, um, and what they do. So like I said, they are the middlemen. So here we have them. Think of them as the middlemen. And as a middleman, they make their money by charging a commission or, and they take a, you know, a little fee here and there. So the more volume that happens in the financial markets, the more money they make. Um, as finance is growing, they're making more and more money. So they're actually very, very rich and they employ the majority of actuaries and accountants who are the two smartest people in the world. Um, and actuaries and accountants go there because they offer massive salaries because they need the smartest uh, people to help them out with their various things. But essentially, what they're doing is they are selling their own liabilities to raise funds that are used to purchase other liabilities. So they sell liabilities and they buy liabilities. Now, at first, that might sound a little bit uh, confusing. So I'm just trying to... It's weird when you spell in capitals, um, sorry, liabilities. My spelling is probably atrocious. Um, so they buy and sell liabilities. Now remember, the best way I think of liabilities is to think of a coin. On the one side, it's an asset. On the other side, it's a liability. So an asset on my um, accounting record will be a liability on your accounting records. For example, Let's say we go to the bank. We go to the bank and we deposit 100 Rand. So we deposit 100 Rand with the bank. Okay. That 100 Rand to us is an asset. But to the bank, that 100 Rand is a liability. So what they've done is by us giving 100 Rand deposit to the bank, they have created this liability on their, uh, their balance sheet. Yes, they've also created 100 Rand cash reserves, but a liability has been created in the sense that they owe us 100 Rand. They then take 90 Rand of that and they lend it to a business to do um, you know, productivity. 
So the bank then lends out 90 rand of our money to a business, um, which is now a liability for that business, but on their bank uh, balance sheet, it will be an asset. And that's why it's, it's, it's important to, to understand the, the, the fundamental principles of accounting when doing finance, because it's kind of like, that's the lingo. Um, it all comes down to, you know, assets, liabilities, and, and all those various things. But what they're doing is they're the middlemen. They're taking money from the investors, from the private individuals, and they're giving it to the businesses. Okay, now why do they exist and why are they making so much money? You know, what, what advantages do they offer? So the advantages of financial intermediaries is their ability to pool resources. So what this means is by pooling resources of many small investors, they are able to, to lend considerable sums to large borrowers or they're able to, to buy some really cool assets. Um, one of the, the cool assets that they do are things like shopping centers. Okay, shopping centers are very popular here in South Africa. Um, the thing is, a shopping center costs a couple hundreds of millions of rands to build, and you know they're, they're worth a lot, but they make a lot of money through rent and all those type of things. Now, as an individual, it's very difficult for you to have a hundred million or so to come by a shopping center. But if you, along with say 2,000 other people, give a bit of money to a financial intermediary, they can pull those resources and they can buy the shopping center in their own name, take the rental income, take off a little bit of their fee, and then give you that rental income. So they can pull resources to buy assets that would not have been accessible to the individual. Remember in the previous video when we were talking about households, we said we need to look at the characteristics of the assets available because shopping centers or some of these you know, exotic assets will not be available to the individual man, but they will be um, available to a large financial intermediary. So yeah, shopping centers. Okay, the next thing is, is that these guys over here can also get a lot of diversification. Okay, um, because let's say once you've pulled your resources, um, let's say you're a very rich individual, you might be able to buy one shopping center. But by coming through a financial intermediary who's getting a lot of you wealthy in individuals, they can maybe uh, by six or seven, maybe even 10 shopping centers around the country that have got different exposures to different markets um, and they can therefore offer you diversification. Uh, one way of thinking of it is as an individual, you can buy into these things known as uh, REITs um, or into uh, shares of property companies and there you can say put in 2,000 Rand and have a 2,000 Rand exposure to the property market, um, and not just to one property, but to the entire property market. So you're getting all these lovely diversification benefits. Okay, also because um, financial intermediaries are making a lot of money, and because this is all that they do, they have a lot of expertise. So they have expertise because this is what they do all day and because they go and they take their fees and they employ actuaries and accountants who, like I told you, are the smartest people on earth. Um, and because of that is they have a significant advantage when it comes to knowledge and understanding of the financial markets. Uh, the man on the street will know less about bonds and stock trading than, say, a big bank or a insurance company or an asset manager. Well, we should hope so. Um, so yeah, they do offer uh, expertise. And then the whole idea is that because if these guys get big enough through economies of scale, they can offer it at lower dealing, administration, and management costs. Um, and I, I think maybe let's put that down to they make things a little bit simpler. So as an individual, if you want to buy shares on the stock market, there's quite a lot of forms you need to fill in, or if you want to do this or do that, you know, there's all this regulation. By coming through a financial intermediary, they take care of that 
And because they're doing it at such a large scale, there's economies of scale, um, lower dealing and administration costs. So these guys make a lot of money because they do offer, I mean, these are a lot of advantages. They're pooling resources, they're doing offering diversification, there's expertise, and you know, they make the whole investment process simpler. But now, what are the disadvantages? I mean, one of the key disadvantages is the asymmetry of risk. So what do I mean by the asymmetry? Am I spelling this word right? The asymmetry of risk. Okay, the idea is that as an individual, I give um, this asset manager, this very smart asset manager, um, 100 rand. There you go, have 100 rand. And the idea is that he's going to take a fee of 5 rand, and then he's going to take 10% of whatever earnings, um, whatever, you know, um, generation that he creates. So if he doubles the investment to say 200 rand, he's going to take a 20 rand fee for himself. Okay, that's 10%. The problem is, is that let's say he goes, well, what he decides to do then is he decides to go to the roulette table. Okay, and he says, I'm going to put 100 rand on black and I'm going to spin. Because if I lose, okay, then I end up with five rand, and that's the fee of taking the money. If I win, I get the fee, plus I get the 10%, so I'm actually getting 25 rand. So I'm going to take a risk where I get either five rand or 25 rand, whereas an individual, what you're getting, what your risk payoff is, is if it comes off wrong, well, you get nothing, and if it comes out right, you're getting, well, 25 minus 200, you're getting 175. So maybe let me actually, let me draw this matrix out a little bit better over here. So let's have the individual and we have the financial intermediary. Okay. And let's say this is best case and this is worst case and this is on a 50 50 risk investment so best case is we get a 175 the worst case is we get zero the financial intermediary best case is that they get 25 and the worst case is that they get five rand now yes it's better for the financial intermediary for to land on the right one however what this does is, oops, what it does is that it makes them take on more risk than they should because they think, listen here, guys, if we take on these risky investments, worst case scenario is we just get our five rand fee. The best case scenario is we getting, you know, 25 rand. That, for them, there's not that much loss. There's not that much, that, no, it's that, bleh. there is not that much loss aversion whereas with the individual. And also, if the individual had taken on this 50-50 risk by themselves, they would have been looking at 200 versus zero as the payoff. So they're actually losing 25 uh, rand of that, or they're giving it to the financial intermediary for playing blackjack or roulette or whatever like that. Yes, there are rules and regulations that say financial intermediaries cannot take uh, in investors' money and gamble with it. You know, they will lose their license and there is regulation preventing that. But when it comes to, say, choosing stock A and stock B, stock A is a, a chocolate factory that's got very predictable sales, very predictable uh, expenses, or stock B, which is a genetically engineering company that does, you know, weird futuristic DNA stuff and they need a lot of capital for R&D, and they're either going to make millions or they're going to go bankrupt tomorrow, um, financial intermediaries might be encouraged or incentivized to take the riskier share because of the payoffs. So that, that is the, the one downside, is that people are 
making money off your money with none of the, the risk exposure like you have. And that's why I feel like all these things can be replaced in the future with artificial intelligence and blockchain technology. So blockchain technology will allow for some sort of cryptocurrency that allows for frictionless uh, transactions, which will allow money to be, you know, invested into one place and then, you know, sold and invested into another place with very, very small fees. And we can write artificial intelligence rules to say, okay, this company meets my risk appetite, therefore we're gonna put shares, uh, sorry, put capital behind that share, or we're gonna move capital to do that because you've now had a child, you have a dependency, and all these various things like that. So I do have a very optimistic look on the future that we're not gonna be relying too much on banks, insurance, pensions, and collective investment vehicles and asset management, because I feel like machines will be able to do that for us. Um, it's just the regulations that are maybe holding that a bit back, but I do feel like we are gonna be seeing this type of revolution or financial disruption very soon. But anyway, that's all I wanna talk about with regards to financial intermediaries, is they are a big player in the economic environment because they you know, can pull all these resources and they are very intelligent with the expertise is they can, you know, what they're wanting in the stock market or, or what their moves are doing will cause the markets to change. So it is very important to understand what the financial intermediaries are doing and what their opinion is. And it's very easy to find that out by just subscribing to their newsletters and reading their chairman's report and seeing what their outlook is on the environment, uh, specifically around economics. And yeah, if you can be a step or two ahead of them, there is opportunity for you to make money in the asset trading game. But anyway, that's all we have time for. Um, in the next video, I am gonna be looking at uh, businesses and their role in the economic environment and what they do for money and investment banks and all that type of stuff. So that's gonna come out tomorrow. So hit subscribe to check out that video. Thanks guys.